Yeah. Okay, so um, thanks again for joining us, Roger. We're going to, in this part, talk about the rise of the super rich and aspects of kind of, I suppose, the more material um, basis from what we've been talking about and talking about before in terms of philosophy. So the first couple of slides I put in the lecture here is just to kind of talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, 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 the rapid rise of um, yeah. income inequality. It's kind of inconceivable how much just wealth the top one, 0 0.1, 0 0.01% mm -hmm. have. Um, and then we can kind of move that, you know, to the number of billionaires. And even this is kind of way dated now. It's, um, mm. uh, it's, yes, it's, down, it's down to eight now. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's the eight people own as much as the bottom 50% now. So the, it's just like getting out of control really in terms of wealth. In, in sociology, now, now, as you said in the in the previous part, like we haven't done a great job of, I think, of thinking about the rich, thinking about the privileged. There's lots of reasons for that. I mean, firstly, they won't talk to us. <laughs> so, you know, it's um we haven't been able to kind of, they, they hide their lives and it's very rare that you see good studies of the privilege, you know, done without kind of doing it through secondary material. But there's other ways of doing it, you know, certainly the concept of gentrification and stuff like that has been key to think about how this has happened in terms of geography. Um, but what we're talking about here is a little bit beyond the kind of traditional understandings of gentrification, isn't it? Oh, so very, very, very much so. Although the notion of gentrification often frames these debates. I mean, it's one of the problems with sociology. You know, we want to hang on to these concepts, even if they function as a kind of a fetter to our understanding. Just yep. before I talk about gentrification, though, Steve, it's quite interesting development in the UK just recently. You're talking about the super rich not talking to us. Uh, well, they might not talk to us, but but actually they know quite a lot of sociology. We've just we've just discovered in the last few few weeks that the new CEO of the London Stock Exchange is a sociologist. Right. As a background in sociology. Yeah. And and the irony is that they're, they're familiar with all of the stuff from science and technology studies and the performativity of economics, and they're running the stock exchange. Anyway, just as just, yeah, just, yeah, just yeah. not, yeah. not as simple as you might think. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Everyone is familiar with gentrification. It's a, it's a great example of you know what Giddens used to call a double hermeneutic, something that was devised within the academy, and then it's now ubiquitous. Everyone uses the concept. But in its traditional form, of course, gentrification referred to the displacement, essentially, of working class populations in situ by the middle classes. Yep. Um, and, and then there was the development of something called super gentrification, which was, you know, those people who had moved into those working class areas who were middle class themselves were displaced by even richer people. Uh, and it kind of it became kind of a bidding war as, as, as areas changed. Yep. I'm not saying that's happening. But what we're seeing in recent times in, in, in London in particular is is something way beyond even super gentrification to the extent that what do you what do you call it when the gentry themselves are being displaced yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, by by new transnational uh, uh, wealth and it's not that they can't live there it's not that they can't afford to live there it's just that they no longer want to live there because of the nature of the uh, the, the wealth that is moving into neighborhoods means that the culture changes quite quite fundamentally yep yep so um what we're going to just got to Get, do, is go through a couple of examples of of what the kind of super rich are doing in terms of where they want to live and this kind of also relates to them trying to you know escape the the material um degradation of the planet in terms of you know what's actually driven their own wealth you mentioned seasteading in the previous yeah. uh video can you tell us a little bit about that yeah well i mean it's 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 more of an ideology and a set of visualizations and it is the reality but but it's important politically it provides a kind of a, a hyperstition a kind of a view of what the future might look like you know post climate change and the idea that we might want to think about investing long term or some people might want to think about investing long term uh, for a life on the sea, you know, for a water world, if you can uh, remember that old movie. Yep. Uh, but the idea that, that with rising sea levels, uh, the super rich might want to think about new architectural forms that, that take them onto the ocean um, uh, in a kind of a, a free market of, of, of movement. Uh, you know, you all have your own individual module and you can move it around. Uh, between uh, between different 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 clusters, yep. so not terribly successful in reality, but kind of a vision of what the future might uh, might hold, funded by uh, billionaire neo reactionaries uh, like uh, Peter Thiel and, uh, and 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 Patrick Patrick Friedman. Yeah, and so and like again, it does sound like science fiction, but like you know, the the iPhone looked a lot like science fiction in my Minority Report, right? These these science fiction does affect the imagination of how the future kind of plays out in many ways, and like. Yeah, the, this is this is definitely what like 
the orientation to the world of these people have is like to both separate themselves from it and protect themselves from the from the risks that the, the, the courts. So the seasteading is one. Well. Go on, you can go back like, and read, the, read, read some of William Gibson's novels and Neil yep. Stevenson's novels from the 1990s, which, which in a sense provide something of a blueprint for the world that we live in now and, and the world yep. that is, is, is emerging. I mean, uh, Neil Stevenson's novel Snow Crash in particular, uh, there's not much in there that he describes that hasn't come to fruition. Yeah, that's right. No, I'd, I'd probably add uh, Ballard's 90s novels into that list as well, the yeah. kind of bored middle class that, and upper middle class that kind of start kind of Turn in reactionary and violent towards the lower classes. Yeah, yeah. a very very good um, example. Yeah. So yeah, and Will Will Davis has, has written a little bit about this, but there's a kind of another kind of visual representation here as well. It's like yeah, well um, it, well it is it's, it's, it's this idea that the 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 the, the super rich have these secessionary tendencies and they use architecture and geography in order to to bring to bring that about. He has this notion of verticality that you know even the language that we use you know the upper classes and the lower classes you know it's, it's built into the way in which we think about the world in terms of hierarchy but now it's physical you know he makes this point that the super rich never seem to be on the same level as the rest of us they're either in their kind of uh, amazing kind of uh, 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 iceberg houses um, and, uh, below us or they're in their high-rise penthouses uh, or they're in their their helicopters or they're out at sea on their seasteads or on their super yachts or now of yeah. course uh, they're, they're they're up in space yeah they're never on the same level though. They're, they're always managing to use technologies and and the vertical aspects of, of, of social differentiation to to somehow uh, get away from 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 the everyday yeah yeah again it kind of makes the kind of the walled city you know and that, that kind of local version of it just kind of taking it to the next level isn't it and like and to be clear here that's not a cruise ship that's someone's home in this <laughs> um, imagination isn't it? it's like that's for like yeah that's that's someone's place that they'll be able to move around in this kind of imaginary future yeah so another version of the kind of after sea setting there's the luxified skies which um is you know again represent represented here um can you yeah, tell us about this, that this is this, this is the, the you know really the, the 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 work of my 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 lovely colleague steve graham and his wonderful book uh, vertical where he tries to encourage us to think about the city, to think about the urban form, not just as a map, but to think about its volumetric consequences as well, especially in high rise places like, you know, uh, Melbourne would be would be a very good example. You know, that um, um, it's not just patterns of segregation, differentiation across the city, it's up and down in the city as well. And he makes the point that, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, high rise housing in particular was really the domain of public housing of, of, of uh, 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 projects and so on. Uh, but that became kind of a, a disaster, poor construction, poor living conditions. And the new high rise, the new verticality is for, for the rich. It's the luxified skies, as, 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 as he calls them. Uh, and, you know, when you look at Melbourne in particular, you know, when you look at the development of all of those residential towers, uh, you can begin to see that it's becoming like a Southeast Asian city. It's becoming like Singapore or Hong Kong or whatever, uh, where you've got huge differentiation of 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 uh, you know the development of these uh, these new architectural forms, relatively recent architectural forms, uh, homes for 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 the super rich. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting. Yeah, the the kind of contradiction distinction between like yeah, that used to be kind of building for poor people and ghettos to kind of crowd them together and build them cheap, and this kind of new version of it is to kind of separate again the the rich from the rest. Um, what's interesting here too, though, is like you know, there, there's limits to this kind of stuff as well. In the sense that, um, you know, uh, for instance, you know, Manhattan is kind of sinking two it's million sinking. year, yeah, yeah. yeah, two million year, and they, they actually, you know, scientists are now saying you can't build any more tall buildings in this place. It's yeah. like not only is the sea rising, the 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 um, the ground is sinking because of the weight. Um, so like, yeah, and there's um, a couple of novelists that have written about like cities like that. That once they do flood, and how they'll become these kind of new kind of aqua cities like with the yeah, yeah. um with the r remaining buildings and stuff like that so there's kind of both a utopian and dystopian um version of how this kind of stuff plays out and depends like mm -hmm. i suppose um how much money you have in terms of which version you prefer but um yeah again the, the kind of the tensions between those it's how they play out who knows yeah, yeah and the so thing i'll like, oh, go on sorry yeah I was going to say, I guess the general point though is that the activities of the super rich are changing the architectural forms of the city for all of us yeah, you know, you don't need to be part of the super rich to see what the super rich are doing within the city in terms of the way in which the built environment is changing in in a way 
that is quite fundamental and is more orientated to their needs than it is to the the, the needs of, 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 of routine denizens. Yeah, yeah. And the third kind of model of this is actually rather than building up, it's building down. Um, yeah. And you've written about the kind of rise of like basement dwellings and uh, multiple stories build underneath kind of what are relatively small kind of townhouse, three story kind of things in London that end up having like eight, nine, even 10 levels below. Um, can you, yeah, can you tell us about what's going on there? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, I think I think the, the the 11 story is a bit of a myth from a novel by, uh, called uh, Number 11 by, uh, 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 yeah, it's, an, it's a novel, but but certainly three and four story um, uh, uh, basement digs are, are quite routine. These things cost millions of quid, um, but it means that, 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 that London, um, for those of, of, of you who are familiar with it, you know, uh, the, the wealth in the city tends to be in, in some of the core areas and many of the buildings there, you know, which are Victorian and Edwardian are listed. You can't do anything to the to the actual uh, uh, look of them. Uh, but if you own the property, you do own all of the land underneath it. So if you want to expand rather than going out or up, people have been going going down and they've been building, you know, some quite amazing constructions, you know, swimming pools with beaches panic rooms, art galleries, God knows what, uh, using new mining technologies under the city. I mean, they're not all on a, on a huge scale, but the, the, in, the, in the, the research that we we, we carried out, we, we, we found almost 8,000 of these things built within the last decade, uh, some of them on a huge scale, some of them more mundane, but nevertheless, huge volumes of soil have been taken out of uh, uh, from under, under London in order to generate these new spaces for, for very, very wealthy people. And is it true that what's happening too, that if someone, you know, there's neighbours and someone will start building down on they'll encroach underneath the place next door and it becomes this kind of political tussle about who owns yeah, the yeah. Earth underneath your no, property? No, well, well, so, some, some of the papers that we've written have been about those sorts of conflicts. You yeah. know, you, uh, you, you, you live next door to, to, to some of these super rich people who start digging away. Uh, and, uh, you know, your life is hell for two or three years. And indeed, in some, some, some infamous uh, instances, we've had collapses. Right. Yeah, it's quite it's quite amusing for many of us to look to look at the super rich uh, fighting against each other. But 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 um, yeah, uh, uh, this is this has been an example of the sort of displacement that I was talking about, where it's not super gentrification. It's where some very very wealthy uh, members of the existing gentry who have lived in central London for years suddenly have someone buy the house next door, and they're then subject to two or three years of digging and dust and vibration. And they want to get the hell out of there because that's not a sort of uh, a world that they want to they want to live in. Yep. Uh, so these sorts of processes have been, you know, big stories here, yep. and yep. Uh, lots of celebrities uh, have featured because unfortunately these 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 big basement things are tanked. And as climate change occurs and we get these flash floods, the water's got nowhere to go other than into the basement. So we've right. got some some very uh, interesting instances of, of of people being 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 washed out. Uh, some very very affluent and very famous people. Have experienced this uh, in the last few years. Interesting. Okay, so I've asked. We've spent the first. I set up the first lecture, to, the part of the lecture, to talk about examples of what's going on, mm -hmm. um, and that kind of, you know, uh, perverse gentrification, one of a better mm -hmm. way to call it. Um, mm -hmm. So, in other parts of your work, um, you've looked at the way that data is being gathered about mm -hmm. us plebs, the non-super rich. Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly to serve the business interests of multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. um, the book you've done, uh, The Predictive Postcode, and you're doing new work about rental markets, about the way that data is being used to manipulate those and manipulate who gets the house in terms mm -hmm. of the very competitive rental market going on. So can you just uh, broadly tell us a little bit about that work? And um, I suppose we're getting to the end mm -hmm. of the course here. Uh, we've, we've spoken a lot about technology and new work and stuff like that mm -hmm. throughout it. Um, how data itself is very much a key to the future of the way we live. Well, it's, 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 the, it's the new oil, really, I suppose, you know, in terms of what drives um, uh, the economy now. I mean, the technology that we were particularly interested in is something called geodemographics, which used to be based upon where you lived. A whole bunch of data about where you live was collected, put into a big statistical pot and uh, uh, put into a classification. And, and one of the reasons we used it for our work on the super rich is because as you say that they're not willing to talk to us often uh, but they can't escape this technology it's not just the plebs who are subject to this you can actually begin to identify the streets uh, uh, and the parts of cities where 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 these people um uh, occupy uh, the space 
But what I should say, Steve, is this is kind of old technology now. What's what's happened is that data on where you live uh, has shifted away to uh, data on where you go. And the ubiquity of uh, mobile phones in particular and the way in which all of our social media and all of our activities are something we carry in our pocket, uh, we can no longer think of those things as phones. They're, they're, they're surveillance machines. I mean, it's very convenient, uh, but you can uh, see where people go. You don't even need to know where they live because you know that there's a certain spot in the city where the phone will rest for six or seven hours every night and you know where they are in space, where people are in space. So the mobile phone is this kind of data uh, sucking device that, that, that has data on your musical tastes, on where you go, uh, uh, what you're spending your money on. Um, and, and that data is, is, is now routinely kind of uh, uh, analysed almost in real time. You're, you're, you're kind of mapping out the city for, for, for these commercial organisations and you're increasingly being targeted uh, within, within space uh, uh, in, in, in ways that I think we're only just beginning to, uh, uh, to understand. So it so, maps so, out the city, it, it, geographically it maps out the city where people live and these uh, data is gathered into these kind of clusters here that um, describe various parts of the city, but it also maps out a self as well, doesn't it? Oh, so absolutely. That, I mean, yeah. the, 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 the impact of these technologies is impacting on uh, your, your, your risks or your chances in all, all different sorts of domains. You'll be based upon where you move with your phone and what's on your phone. You'll be put into a statistical cluster, quite a nuanced statistical cluster that will be used to make calculations about insurance, uh, credit, uh, the likelihood of voting in certain sorts of ways. These, these technologies are frighteningly predictive. Uh, and, and actually, in, in, in a sense of uh, the, the, the sort of the, not the embodiment, but the, 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 the kind of scary sense that, that we all feel that we're autonomous and that we have choice and that we're all unique individuals. But actually, this, this technology suggests otherwise, that just where you move and what you have on your phone is frighteningly predictable. And it's actually very, very difficult to think about kind of stratagems by which you can, you can avoid uh, um, not using these mobile devices, which themselves kind of recursively uh, classify you, and uh, uh, then um, in a, in a kind of recursive loop, come back to um, present you with a set of affordances um, in relation to the access that you have to uh, to a whole set of resources. So uh, certainly, like in that Borgesian sense, taste classifiers. Um, yeah. Are you getting to the and you know the the, the extension as classifiers a classifier, but the classifier here is a inanimate kind of piece of technology sending information to a company that then classifies you yeah yeah well and, and what is that company what is that technology it's a machine increasingly it's ai or machine learning so even the people who wrote the original code don't know what the means are by which people yeah. come to be classified it's driven by what works so um if 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 the classification is useful in predicting what you do how you vote where you go what you buy that's what they're interested in so it's, it's no longer kind of a human agent sitting there and thinking, you know, uh, carefully about uh, 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 what kind of Borgiosi and classification we could put you in that has some sort of marketing nuance. It's a kind of a, a, a machinic drive that is, is simply driven by consumer behaviour and the core data that we, we, we leave behind. It comes back to that question about the socialist calculation problem again. It's not necessarily about price data. We have real-time data on where people are, what they're consuming, where they're going, uh, 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 which which is is a new world. Yeah, it seems yep. to me we, we have this kind of real time monitoring. It's the first time that we've we've been metricized as humans, uh, yep. and and the consequences of that are, are are profound. I think back in the day it was a slower process. <laughs> it would be used for planning, and it would be used to decide where you were going to locate certain services. And uh, now it happens in real time. You know, you've got instances where you can be, you know, sent a coupon or a, a or a. Uh, a token of some sort that you have to spend within 30 minutes or something because they yep. know where you are and they know what sort of thing that you're interested in so it's so in the world kind of, so you kind of uh, there's a kind of connotations here like um in the in like you know western white countries we're kind of concerned about china's social credit system but like mm. in, in a, essence this seems to be happening behind our backs anyway yeah no absolutely i mean th this is exactly a it's, it's a shift away from <laughs> Uh, financial credit uh, uh, scoring to social credit scoring. And the thing is, we don't know what we should be doing to improve our score because nobody knows because the machine tells them. But right. actually in the future, uh, you know, it, it, it's, you know, go and go back and, and watch Black Mirror. Go back yeah. and watch 
fantastic episode where, where in a sense you know uh, Facebook escapes and and, and your your day-to-day -day activities are kind of constantly rated we're there we're there already and we're there in a far more profound sense um so you know what you're listening to on Spotify you know could in the future come back to bite you because if there is some kind of relationship between the sorts of genre of music that you like and your ability to pay the rent for for reasons that people aren't aware of um, it will have consequences. So you yep. might end up with a full credit score without really understanding what it is that you've done in the past that's going to uh, open up uh, access to a whole range of, of, of activities in the future. Yep. Gee, so do you think we'll get the point for like, and when we're, when we're running out of time, this will be the last thing I'll ask you is like, if even like you might have similar credentials, similar wealth, live in a similar place, but your actual cultural tastes will... Um, rank you differently to where you may pay different amounts for insurance yeah, or something I, compared on that kind of thing? I think so, if it's, if it's predictive of things that will generate value for them. But I yeah, think no. what we'll see is a shift away just from individual characteristics to individ to, to characteristics of, of, of households and families. Increasingly, um, it's not just the risk associated with you as an individual. It will be related to what your parents do, what your grandparents do, what your brother and sister do in terms of thinking about, you know, what, what Lisa Atkins calls in her work, you know, the Minsky and household, the idea that, that increasingly households function as businesses and, and the risk associated with you as an individual is now kind of uh, yeah. contextualised by all of that data as well. Yeah. You might have exactly the same characteristics, but if you've got grandparents who have got a lot of equity in their home and someone else hasn't, then you, you're going to have a better chance of actually accessing a mortgage or accessing a particular rental property. So the data essentially um, calcifies cultural capital into a predictive sense. It's yep. um, it in the past only been done through judgment and other people kind of doing it through social capital. Now it's happening through data. It's become an ontological. I mean, in, in, in a yep. sense that, that, that your cultural taste and preferences uh, will quite quickly uh, be presented as a set of affordances, a set of material affordances based upon your, your taste and preferences. And it will be sold as consumer choice. But, yeah. but actually, it will be a, a recursive loop uh, driven by the market, uh, operationalized through these metrics. And, and very few people will understand the means by which these predictive analytics work. Yeah. Okay, Roger, thanks a lot. I'll um, we've come quickly run out of time. Thanks again for joining us today. I'll, I'll stop the recording my, there. My pleasure. Uh, and I hope it's been of some use. Yes, yeah, thanks.